So cute as you all start slowly trickling in, welcome to our virtual space. We can see there's approximately 12 of you now online and you're slowly trickling in. So we'll give you another couple of minutes before we do a karaoke and open today's session. Oh, I think we can start off with a karakia. So, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te ponga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tāra tāra ki tai, e hi ana, ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Kia ora koutou katoa. welcome to another Tau Caucus webinar. Today we have a very special um, guest and a really interesting topic and we'll go a little bit more into that in a second. I'm um, really wanting to acknowledge the Indigenous lands that I'm broadcast, well we're in a similar whenua today um, with our, with our um, webinar uh, presenter, so acknowledging the Indigenous lands that we're standing on today and acknowledging the Indigenous lands all of you are connecting through to us today. Um, just a bit of virtual housekeeping before we get going is, as per usual, for those who are regulars to our space and lovely to see so many familiar names, um, to interact with us, you can go on to the chat, which is, um, which is the little speech bubble icon down the bottom. And as a default, your chat settings will only communicate with Yvonne and I. Um, and if you want to talk to everyone just next to the two all panellists, go on the drop down box and you can go to all panelists at, and attendees. Please let us know who you are and where you're from. So get used to the chat straight away and um, start connecting in. I see someone's already found the Q&A box. So the other way to interact with us is through the Q&A box, which is the two speech bubbles together. And that's where you can ask questions. If you do make a mistake and ask a question in the chat space, that's fine. We will just copy and paste it through to the Q&A. So that's um, just the virtual housekeeping out of the way. And kia koutou, my name is Miriam Sessa. I'm the Toei Caucus Manager for Te Ahina National Network in Sexual Violence Together. And just acknowledging that we're a two fighter um, organization and we have a kaupapa Māori side of our organization as well. So in today's session, I warmly, warmly welcome Yvonne, um, who is from HELP, and I'll let her do more of her introductions. And today's session is all about specialist sexual violence court support role, which I'm particularly interested having as a crisis support worker um, gone to court with a few clients and the complexity of that space is so amazing to be able to get a more in-depth understanding of the work um, that Yvonne does. So I'm going to hand over to you Yvonne to do this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, kia ora Miriam. So kia ora koutou. My name is Yvonne and I'm the court support counsellor for Justice Services Health Auckland. So I have been working with survivors of sexual violence for eight years and nearly five of which have just been specific to this role. Um, so I have an academic background in psychology, gender and women's studies and social work. And my master's degree sort of dived into um, alternative trials and justice models for sexual violence offending in Aotearoa. So a bit about this webinar, the outline today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this role. So I'm standing on the shoulders of other, um, other women who have done this work, always very aware of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, um, if you're thinking about developing this role, what that might look like. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about supporting people from other cultures. We're also going to talk a bit about why we need this role, which is because of the adversarious justice model and re-traumatisation. Then, like survivors, I'm going to take you through a journey through our courts with this support so that you get a better idea of how we walk alongside survivors through this really challenging process. Then I'm also going to look at some hopefulness and some, uh, I'm always thinking about this this dream court, this future where um, the justice um, system actually takes care of survivors. And so we'll talk a bit more about some current developments in that. Also, I am going to be talking about topics that people might find difficult or a bit triggering. So if you do need to um, debrief or talk with someone, then um, I think Miriam's going to be providing the national helpline to call. Okay, let's get started. Right. So 
the background. I talked about standing on the shoulders of other women who've done this work. So Help Auckland formalised this role um, over 15 years ago. And I mean, like many crisis services in Aotearoa, um, help has been providing support for survivors going through you know, the court for a long time. And the formalisation of this role came about due to um, a growing awareness and attention from frontline workers, survivor specialists and academics alike of the experiences of re-traumatisation inherent in our adversarial justice system and the need for some independent trauma-informed support and advocacy survivors who are navigating the system. Uh, Help Justice Services also gave birth, or um, especially when we're thinking about what would be a better model. So um, Project Restore, which is a restorative justice process, was also um, not born out of this, but you know, evolved out of this role as well. Uh, now, since I have been working in this role, there have been some positive changes that have come about from the Auckland and Whangarei Sexual Violence Court pilot, as well as an Ministry of Social Development evaluated pilot of this role. Um, the changes are somewhat minimal compared to greater changes needed, um, but there is some hopefulness, and as I said, we'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Okay. So... When thinking about developing this role in, as part of a crisis service, it's helpful to sort of think about the differences in supporting someone in a in sort of more inherently abusive environment, which is the court, versus, you know, not versus, but compared to supporting someone who has just decided to report or has or is in crisis and has um, come through the police or through medical services. So after a recent assault, the crisis response is aimed at reducing secondary trauma, advocating for the person, while well, the court process produces and kind of is secondary trauma. Uh, so this role differs because its purpose is to reduce tra trauma by preparing and supporting survivors for this foreseeable crisis of going to trial. So it is, I wouldn't call it quite a prevention model, but it is probably closer to a prevention model where the abusive phenomena that we are attempting to address is adversarial law. So when we are thinking about court culture, oh, sorry, um, when we're thinking about the different responses that um, the different sort of crisis response that you might have with a survivor who has had the preparation of the service with someone who hasn't. Um, so just survivors who have engaged with, with this, um, with court support, they've been encouraged to develop coping strategies, an internal locus of control, you know, positive self-talk, so that with our support they can manage the trial as best as possible. Um, whereas when I have been called into a trial on the day with having no contact with the client before. It's very much similar to that frontline crisis, you know, response where you're um, using your clinical assessment skills and your rapport building and understanding of the formal process at hand to better, you know, prepare the client so that it's less challenging. But I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to highlight is having the preparation and support before court um, as much as is an ideal than actually just turning up on the day of the trial. Um, now, let's talk a bit about court culture. Um, if you're thinking about your local court and uh, how, how would I bring this role into that court? What is it that I need to do? I think the first thing to understand is that from, from, even from doing this work across Auckland and different courts, I can safely say that the courts are uniform in many ways but each court is going to have its own um, culture based on the professionals who work there, you know, the officers in charge and the local, local Crown and law professionals and the victim advisors. So it's really important to form positive working relationships with the professionals connected to your client's trial and local court. Uh, these relationships all have very distinct roles and they will help. They're all there to benefit the client. So it's always better if you develop those relationships so that we can work together really smoothly. Okay. 
So supporting people from other cultures. So Aotearoa New Zealand, we've inherited a Eurocentric justice system from Britain. And Britain has made really positive changes, which we still haven't. So um, I won't jump down that rabbit hole, but um, obviously one justice model doesn't fit all. And this is, a, this is like a very, um, it's not contemporary, it's quite patriarchal, and it's very ill-suited for um, this kind of offending. And it doesn't fit, um, and it's not for everybody, it doesn't, um, we, this one size fit all justice model just does not work. There are multiple justice needs, okay? So restitution, you know, restoration, this need for accountability and safety and healing within families and communities. So people who come, in, come into contact with the justice system from other cultures may never have these needs met. And I'm also holding what it might mean for them to be in contact with our justice system and with me. And I'm a Pākehā woman. And here I am, and this Pākehā woman is going to be your support person. I mean, they always have choice in this. But at the moment, I am the sole court support uh, specialist in Tamaki Makaura, which means I'm constantly working on my cross-cultural practice, constantly engaging in cultural consultation and training with kaupapa Māori, immigrant, refugee, Pacifica, and Asian professionals in sexual violence services. So, yeah, it's, on, it's ongoing. Of course, I would love it if there were more, 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 <laughs> and people from different backgrounds. Having one person um, doing this work is, I mean, that poses lots of different challenges, but particularly with working with other cultures. So uh, in regards to cultural humility, this is something that I practice. I mean, ju our justice system is dualistic. It's very black, it's very white. And that is um, not how I operate in the world. Most people don't necessarily operate like that in the world. So, you know, when I'm thinking about cultural humility, we're also looking at the fact that there are multiple lenses okay there's multiple realities there's nobody is the expert or under completely understand another person's way of seeing and lived experience um and of course i have my own cultural lens and i don't want to impose this onto others i mean justice systems are the transmission of rules and values decided by a dominant section of society and when people come into contact with it it is our system is very pakeha and it has a lot of power um, so with this in mind, when I work with them from other cultures, I'm always learning from them. I am not, nor will I ever be the expert in someone else's life. Nor do I want to be another person who comes along into this person's life and imposes my, their worldview and, and expectations and values onto them. Because this is what the court system does. And hopefully this role is a salve to that. Okay. Um, I think the other the other thing that I I find when I think about working with other cultures is, you know, I doing this work for this long has meant that I make mistakes, and I also need to own those mistakes as well. And I'm, you know, something that I'm very aware of when I'm working with people from other cultures is that along the way I might make get something wrong and there's also something for me cultural humility is also being able to admit it or be able to own that yeah okay so <sighs> the adversarial justice model re-traumatization so this is actually how i ended up doing this work because i was I became acutely aware of just from just from working, you know, working down in Wellington um, as a crisis worker, and I'm sure like many of you out there, I just became very aware of how our, how our justice system traumatizes survivors. So I think I'm, I'm going to, I do have to talk a little bit about what adversarial law is, because some of you might be like, well, what, tell me what adversarial law is. So in a nutshell, <laughs> it's this um, idea of justice which says, that um, the person who's been accused is presumed innocent, that they haven't done anything and that the evidence has to be tested. And the evidence that needs to be tested is, of course, a survivor's experience of abuse. Okay, and to test abuse, what does that mean? It involves minimizing it, telling them that they're lying, um, 
you know, d diminishing and invalidating it. And also convincing 12 strangers on a jury that this person is lying. So that's a very, you know, poor fit when it comes to this kind of offending. And because the defense wins by using these strategies, um, the whole idea of seeding doubt, um, you know, means that juries who might already come in with some kind of victim blaming or, or infused with rape myths are more likely to go, oh yeah, no, yeah, of course, no, she's making it up and, oh, you know, she has a difficult background and oh, she doesn't present very well in the courtroom. So, yeah. And when I think about um, the years that I've sat in trials, and I, I find myself thinking about what survivors are experiencing in our justice system. Um, and I always think of it in relationship to scales. I mean, when, I think of, when we think about fairness, we think about this evenness. And then I think about survivors and I'm always like, oh, it's a bit like that for them. Um, so bear with me while I take you through some of my analogies about this. Um, so this, is, this slide is what I'm thinking about when I think about what survivors are entering the justice system with, like internal working models or experiences. Um, and these are very important issues that the justice system cannot adequately respond to or address, even though that is, you know, um, part of the reason why they have decided to report and come this far. So it doesn't alleviate and counter some of these very understandable issues and can sad, sadly be additive. So this is my slide of survivors entering the justice system. And you might want to have a little read of the little, of what they might bring, what they have with them when they're coming in. And this is also, this is how I see it when they exit. Um, and when I think about survivors frequently exiting the system, still not having these really important needs met. I see this role as being responsive somehow to this. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that um, at the end. Okay, so back to my scales. So this is what a fair trial process looks like for the survivor. So the defendant's right to a fair trial and then the survivor's needs. The defendant it's heavily weighted to the defendant, okay? They don't have to take the stand. They're not being tested. They're not cross-examined. Um, they can just sit in the courtroom and have their lawyer, you know, completely rip apart the survivor's experience and not have to just sit there and... and yeah. They are allowed to appeal guilty um, verdicts. They're allowed to, um, you know, direct the defence's questions, whereas the survivor, they have no say in the process. They have no input into, um, into what the Crown is going to talk to them about. Um, they also don't have a control over the narrative of their experience. Their narrative is, is controlled by the, way that, by the questions that they're asked and the fact that they have to answer the questions correctly. So um, it's very, this, this idea of a fair trial, when you actually look at it, when you actually look at who it's protecting, it's not, it's the defendant. Okay. So another, oh, okay. So when I think about what, I mean, it's never going to be this even, not until we have a different justice model. But um, this role is an attempt to balance survivors' needs. So with the, with the right support and advocacy and correct transparent information and preparation, we can start to address, we can meet some of those needs. We can't meet the justice needs, but we can meet um, their needs in regards to them having a fairer experience of the trial. Okay. Court is a strange and scary land to navigate. I, every person who comes, who enters into our justice system, they, they, don't, they haven't spent a lot of time there. I mean, the people who understand and can navigate this land best are predominantly 
criminal justice professionals. And so what that means is you've got this bunch of people who have this sort of privileged access to, um, to knowledge and to this arena. So I think of this role, you know, we're, we're, it's like we're a guide through this really strange and scary land, you know, where the survivor doesn't know how this, this court culture works. There are rules that just don't make sense in the real world. And, you know, let's face it, for any of us, when we don't know the lay of the land, we're a bit, we can be a bit anxious and, and afraid, okay? And so hopefully this role equips them with the under, this understanding of how the strange land works, where the terrain gets difficult, and what they might need to pack for their journey. Um, so I give them tools and a map, and I walk alongside them, encouraging them how to use and read those tools. And oh, because I understand what's ahead, I can also help them navigate the difficult thing that is ahead. So um, information and transparency. So the intrigue and power that law has, I mean, this is reflected in the endless stream of TV shows about criminal justice. You know, criminal justice professionals are often portrayed as modern day heroes with this uncanny insight and inexplicable wisdom. Um, however, at the end of the day, survivors need the right information. I, I've lost count the amount of times that I've had to say, it's not like TV, that's not going to happen. This is how it works. So especially because a lot of them do expect it to be really dramatic and I mean it is dramatic but on a different level it hasn't got the excessive pacing of the lawyers and wig adorned and hammer happy you know judges um, and because survivors are not the ones driving the prosecution process there's a that team of people with access um, to the, how the legal system works and decision making are in the driver's seat so in this role by providing correct accessible information gives the survivors a sense of autonomy and control back because they're like oh, I understand this I get this I know what this means um, so knowledge of what is happening um, and what the possible outcomes will be is really important so in this role we need to be able to explain legal processes uh, and the implications and purposes of hearings and trial processes um, having a good understanding of our criminal justice court system is really vital in this role um, just so that they can have someone explain the strange land of court sans legal jargon and not from a legal professional's lens, but just from a, per, a, a person's lens, a person who's walking alongside them. This is what this means. Um, there's also, you know, in regards to exploring what they may expect at trial, getting their feelings and reactions, I think it's really important that we, that gets explored early on because um, that also helps prepare them and create a sort of internal scaffolding around, oh, this is a really normal reaction and response to um, what is happening right now. Um, and there's also, for, you know, something I've noticed is, it might just be a very human thing, but there can be this idea that people should hide or edit difficult information from people who've, um, you know, who have experienced trauma. However, I have found that hiding info makes it worse for survivors. If they're going to feel angry if they get to the end of this journey through court and they haven't been given the truth. Or they, you know, as professionals, we know how to discuss the truth in a supportive and empathetic way. I mean, that's our job. And how we talk to somebody with anxiety will differ from somebody who doesn't have anxiety. Um, so yeah, not, not being afraid of normal responses from survivors concerning challenging information. Um, yeah, really important. So, because we have, we give the right info, we're not being perceived as having lied to them and led them down a path that was not the one that they expected. It's really, really important. Okay, court. Court is a long-term extended crisis and because it takes forever. And we all know, well, I hope I'm going to say that most people must be aware that trials take a very long time and they're not controllable. They're out of, they're out of legal professionals control. You know, most, most of the um, clients who've been with this service, have, most of the clients who come through the service, they're on average, they're with me for maybe a year, sometimes 18 months. And um, I also have, I'm still working with people that have been here since I first began, which was nearly five years ago. 
Okay. <laughs> so, of course, so much can change for survivors in that time. I mean, a whole lot changes in our lives in a year. So um, this role needs to be flexible to meet their changing needs along the way. Um, the other thing is life often goes on hold um, while waiting for trial because the court and prosecution is out of survivors' um, control. It's our role to sort of prioritise their needs and also help give them a sense of control over their lives again. Um, so from being very, I mean, ideally we get involved at the very beginning from when the um, offender is arrested right through to whatever the end might be. Um, yeah, so the thing that for, for most people who come through the come through the um, come through the service, they might be they might just might have the initial contact, and then once a the trial date gets set, that's when we do a lot of that preparation and support work and getting them ready for trial. But then, of course, it's for other people, it's not going to be like that. It depends on what they in, when they enter the service, what else might already be going on for them, and some people will just need more advocacy and support along the way and others. But the main thing that's important is that we are flexible to um, help support in their changing needs along this journey. And because the trial date is often described as a dark cloud hanging over me, um, I really want, I really encourage survivors to still make plans to not put everything on hold to take care of and identify what they might need um, to heal, whether they need um, therapy, where they need to um, get ahead in their job or study, or they need some time out to, take, to be taken care of and maybe reassess things. So I'm always encouraging them to focus on what they have control over and not let what they have no control over beleaguer and overwhelm them. So it's really important because it helps, it helps sort of disentangle them from being controlled further by the offender and what they are doing and what they're telling their lawyer to do. So let's begin. Okay, so from here, I'm going to take you all through what it might be like to come into the service and go through to the end of the trial. So I've chosen a picture of a labyrinth because I, I like to think, I, I think in pictures and I definitely, because of the nature of this work, I, th I think of court, the court process as a journey. Um, and in particular, a labyrinth. Um, because with a labyrinth, you enter it and you can't see an end. You don't know what is ahead. So because in this role, I've walked this labyrinth, um, I can help troubleshoot what may lay ahead and prepare them for what might lay ahead. Um, I'm also a, comp a companion and a guide. Um, I'm a, and along the way, I'm there for them to offload about what has become heavy and difficult and unfair because it, there's so many things along the way that are unfair. And I'm also the person to sit with at the end once we've gotten out the other side of the labyrinth. Someone who can sit and, you know, reflect back to them about their experience through the justice system and also how they got through, you know, look at what you did there. Look at these things that you have learned. So, yeah. Let's begin. <laughs> okay, so on the ground. Um, this is a very simplistic way of um, going through the labyrinth. <laughs> it's not linear, um, but I will take you through what each of these each of these stages looks like. So we've got um, the pre-trial support, the advocacy along the way, what the preparation sessions before the trial look like, what the in-court support is, looks might look like before trial, and then post the post-trial support and follow-up. Okay, so pre-trial support. So from when somebody first comes into our service, um, obviously the focus is on therapeutic relationship building and rapport building. Also identifying um, any, any kind of presenting trauma. Um, so if there's dissociation or anxiety or depression, 
and avoidance. I mean, a lot of people are wanting to avoid reminders of abuse. And then there's court, which is like this big constant reminder. Um, we're also looking at um, the sa their safety, their support networks, what the home environment is like. Um, now with support especially, um, we're looking at what is the, what's going on with the family. Um, are there any other services involved? And with relationships, how, who are these with and what is the quality of these? Of, also, often who the offender is is going to highlight um, where they may have lost support. So for example, if the offender was part of a peer group, they might have lost quite significant peer relationships and, you know, and their community. And of course, for the family, we might have family members who do believe them or don't believe them or withdrawal of support. Um, and then with a child and a parent, we've also got a family that is in crisis. There might be Oranga Tamariki involvement. Um, and then we have a child who might feel responsible for this crisis for breaking up the family. So um, this role in regards to fostering positive relationships, we're kind of role modeling secure attachment. Like I am here for you, um, following through with what we say and do. Um, we're on a long journey with them and they need to see that we're trustworthy and safe. Um, we're responsive in, you know, in practical ways leading up to the trial. Um, so if we, we need to support them at court related appointments, ensuring that their needs and voices included in the process as much as possible and then being responsive therapeutically. So normalizing and stabilizing, um, helping them with coping skills. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, from the very from the moment that we are in contact with them, we are working with them to um, address their needs and give them some coping strategies. Because if they are starting to feel taken care of and they're starting to develop skills that actually work um, or, or if they don't work they're able to say to me oh this isn't working and I go well maybe we could try something different then we're already starting to help prepare them for the possibility that the trial because well, trials don't always happen but the possibility of that trial and now I have a case example and it's not a real person so Cara is a it's a generic example of, um, of somebody who might come into the service. Um, so she was, she came through, um, she'd been recently sexually assaulted by a peer. She had no history of um, self-harm or suicide, but she had had an eating disorder when she was 15, 16 and had gone into treatment for this. She described herself as being that I understand myself really well. And it was quite clear that she was very clever and very reflective. She was also currently in therapy. And she's also said to me, oh, I didn't want to come to this meeting today. I'm, all, I'm always trying to avoid things, anything or any reminders of what happened. And she'd actually said that she'd been thinking of ways of trying to get out of coming to the appointment. However, she talked herself around. Uh, she described her relationship with their parents as not very close. They were very practical. They did practical things for each other. Um, she also was a high achiever. She um, needed to be needed, and she took on loads of work, loads of tasks at her work, for, that, which were actually unmanageable. Um, the other thing that, because she was so um, such a high achiever, part of the first session was she wanted to make sure she answered all the questions right at trial. So part of my initial work there with her was, you've already got the answers. There's no right or wrong answer. You know, there's not an exam. You, you, you've, you've got the truth. You, this is your experience. You know it, and you're the expert in that. Um, yeah, so the other areas that we looked at were um, what, you know, what supports did she have, you know, seeing as the offender had been someone in a peer group. And it turned out that she still had a very strong peer group because she did dance and um, she belonged to some other social groups. Um, and now when we started talking a bit more about the practicalities of the trial, I noticed that she started kind of zoning out or she became very, like she wasn't quite there. And so I said, hmm, hey, you seem to be like zoning out. Am I really that boring? And she laughed and then she... <laughs> She said that she, 
she notices when this starts happening. Um, she she kind of has this awareness that she's kind of slipping out or um, zoning out. Um, and I said to her, well, how do you, you know, is there any way that you try and deal with it when it happens yourself? Um, she said, oh, well, if I get up and move around, this this helps. And she said she'd also started doing dance a few months earlier because she found that dancing really helped her stay connected and, and, and encouraged her to be in her body. So, of course, we talked about how we might be able to bring this into managing a trial. And I also discussed just knowing that, you know, when people dissociate, especially in a courtroom, um, you know, if there's no, you know, the defence lawyer might continue to ask questions and the person will just start going, yes, yes no no um so i discussed um closed circuit tv as an option for her to give evidence because in in that environment um it's much easier for you know to ask for breaks and to help address that um that issue so i talked a bit with her about whether or not she might think of that as an option okay so advocacy so because of all the power dynamics inherent and entering a, uh, our justice system, there can be, um, and of course it can be really intimidating for most people to be dealing with criminal justice professionals. Um, something that this role does is if there's anything that they need along the way, we advocate for them for what it is that they need. I mean, there are some things that we, and we can't change the process of a trial, but we can definitely um, ask for you know different modes of evidence um, we can I, we can talk to the crown prosecutors about oh this client you know she's um you know she's just recently gotten out of a mental health respite um, we've got a plan in place but if you could just you know have a word with the judge that maybe we can put in some regular 20 minute breaks so we can do that that's the sort of advocacy that we can do but we can't change the nature of the questions and what the defence counsel is ultimately going to do. Um, it's also if they are involved with other services. Um, so, for example, with Cara, even though she was in therapy, she wasn't involved with other services. But I did ask, I would ask, would you like, would, would you like me to liaise with your therapist? Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But um, if, they, if they do agree, then it's really important that we work quite closely with those services um, about their changing needs along the way or what sort of, you know, what sort of treatment are they, are they getting? What, what are the skills and strategies that they're learning in this other service? Because that also helps inform what we're doing as well. Okay, and also the more supported um, the survivor feels, the better. Yeah. Another thing um, is that, you know, when there's a trial, you know, with a trial coming up, it often means taking time off work um, and maybe it might, might often trials fall in the middle of exams. I mean, they never happen at a good time. So another thing that um, this role does is advocate, you know, uh, you know, we'll write letters to employers and educational providers, not talking about the, the nature of the trial, but very generically asking, you know, but legally they're a witness, they have to go to trial trials are very unpredictable, this person's going to need some flexibility with um, work or their studies. Yeah. And so with Cara, for example, she asked, she was after what she came to me, she goes, actually, Yvonne, I really want to give evidence via closed circuit TV. Are you able to arrange that for me? And I was able to talk to the victim advisors and the police and get that um, application in place. Uh, also, she needed a letter to her employer as well about taking that time off work, so I was able to do that as well. Okay, so the preparation sessions. So, <laughs> obviously closer to a trial date, people's um, anxiety increases, increases in trauma responses, we might see more nightmares, um, people might start sleeping really badly, um, their anxiety might, um, you know, become more heightened, which is all very normal closer to a trial. Um, there's, you know, also more, more fear and more concerns, all this like, oh no, you know, am I going to see him at the court, like, um, or, or his family, are they going to be there? So um, we really do start doing a lot of a lot of containing and holding the closer that we get to trial. 
Um, it's also important that we start really focusing on, you know, what their strengths are and also what it is that what their vulnerabilities might still be. Okay, so for example, um, with Kara, she, you know, one of her biggest vulnerabilities was that she, you know, was dissociative and she, she, she called me up and said, it's getting worse, it's getting much, much worse. Um, it all just happened, you know, and I won't, I don't have any control over it. So I was able to encourage her to talk to her therapist more about more developing more coping strategies, working on the grounding techniques that we were already, um, you know, already had developed together and also talk to the police about um, making sure that the Crown knew that and asking the judge for reg very regular breaks and for the judge to intervene when he would see that she wasn't quite there. So being able to do that, it really helped because she was like, oh, oh good, when I'm giving my evidence, they know what's happening for me and they're gonna res and it's gonna be responded to as best as possible. Um, so, when i think the other thing which so i, I mean cara as an example is particular she's particularly avoidant so she's also in saying that i did all this work there was also a period of time where she wouldn't come to appointments so um you know she avoided appointments she kept cancelling them and then for example i might give, have a phone call with her and unpack what was and unpack what was happening, um, and you know so that will happen. And because of the nature of an avoidant person, is that a lot of the work was done in the like say three or four days leading up to the trial. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of we we can be very aware of the issues and challenges that survivors bring with them. And we, but we really can only do what we can um, as well, you know, with our understanding of what their trauma is and the, the very real um, fear of going to court. Okay, so when we are, um, I'm so sorry. When we, when we are in the court, at the court and we're supporting them um, at trial, by this stage we have already established their coping strategy, their, psycho, their psycho, psychosocial skills and strategies that are already in place for court. And we've also got a plan for what they're going to, what they're going to be doing while they're at trial, who they, who's, who's going to be in their lives during that, and what's the plan when they finish giving evidence. So also helping them plan for things that they have control over. Okay, because the court process, because the trial is not predictable, and we've prepared them for that unpredictability. Oh, it might not start on time, and oh, lawyers, when they get together, they love to have an argument, so there might be a few hours where, you know, we're actually waiting. So we've prepared them for that unpredictability, but, and we, but then we've also given them, as I said, that some things that are tangible that they have control over. And while they're giving evidence, um, and they've got those skills, as a court support person, we are paying attention to everything that is happening for them. And we need to be really responsive to what arises for them throughout. Now, of course, when they're giving evidence, we can't do anything. We can't stop. We can't go, hey, enough. Um, we have to wait for the next break in order to address um, what is happening. Um, we, I mean, we have encouraged them to take breaks if they're very, if they're very distressed, if they need to stop. Um, yeah, but we, we can't intervene. And that's actually, that's hard as a practitioner um, to witness. But with, as long as we've done all that preparation, it can really help. Um, I mean, we're asking a lot of survivors, we're really asking them to go and give evidence in this really difficult environment. And then, hey, and you're gonna need some tools and skills to help take care of yourself, okay? So, you know, some of the things that I encourage is the soothing self-talk, reminding themselves of the expert and their experience, 
that they can give themselves permission to um, stop and take care of themselves. And I've come this far because what happened was wrong. And with us paying attention um, and identifying stress and overwhelm, during the breaks, we can, you know, give, we can go, hey, I noticed that bit was really difficult. And, oh, that was really upsetting, wasn't it? And we give them that space. Oh, they're noticing what's happening for me. And, um, and, and they're paying attention to what's happening to me. Um, so, yeah. Also, if their needs change during a trial process. So, if, for example, um, they, you know, they need to, they get to like two o'clock on one of the days and they just say, oh, I just can't keep going. I need to stop. I just, can you please, I just, there's no way that I can keep going through this cross examination today. Uh, so then, of course, I will check in with the officer in charge who will ask for the trial to, to um, be halted for the rest of the day. And so, and that is really important too, because they, they will, you know, I mean, we can't always guarantee that we can, you know, successfully say, let's stop for the day. But if they need us to ask, then we ask and we do everything we can um, to get that need met. So at the end of the trial, what do we we have to unpack we have to debrief we have to talk about what next and in um you know in Kara's case um it was a guilty verdict however um the offender was found guilty of most of the sexual assault charges but not the rape charge which to her was the most that would cause the most harm so we unpacked how this felt for her she was tearful and angry that these 12 people didn't believe her. Um, I talked about how these people, they weren't there and they weren't the experts in what happened. And they, you know, um, there are people that get it and there are those that don't, you know. And I think, you know, it was just for her, like the woman in her peer group who had made a decision not to believe her. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about how people will choose to um, believe something based on how they need to feel about themselves and feel okay with the world. And often it's not the cold hard realities of um, sexual violence offending. Um, I also talked to her about how she is still believed. And even though the um, offender wasn't found guilty, it doesn't change that he did do that. And that there are people that do believe her when she, um, you know, which is why it came this far. And we also talked about her disappointment and not having any control over that. And we had a plan as well after the verdict. She was going to be celebrating with her friends or she planned to hang out with her friends and her friends had been like, yay, it's, it's guilty, let's go have fun. But she wasn't feeling that, it was very bittersweet. So I encouraged her to talk to her friends about what she might need. You know, maybe she just needs to have some quiet time to talk about how she feels, that it's not, you know, that she doesn't feel like it's positive and celebratory. But I also encouraged her to acknowledge that she had made it through and talked about how she had managed that. Yeah. And then usually after that, there's, I mean, the Crown will come down and talk to them and then the victim advisors will be talking to them. And there's a whole lot of people crowding around at the end when the verdict is um, delivered. So at that stage, it's also important for them to go, okay, off you go. I'll check in with you tomorrow. Or if there is something that pops up, addressing it right then and there. But yeah, generally it's, um, they, it, it's like they need space and time to step away and process what's just happened. Not everyone's the same, but generally it is like that. Um, with a not guilty verdict, I mean, obviously we've got this very um, traumatic outcome to a very, to a traumatic experience. So you know, we need to really unpack that and validate their anger and grief about that. Um, obviously, the, and what sort of, if, there's gonna, if there are any safety issues in regards to their response to this and any sort of further support. Um, with a hung trial, we've got this possibility of um, a retrial happening or what their feelings might be about this. Um, and also, what they, depending if they want to go to, back to trial, is being able to go and talk to the Crown about what those needs might be. And if, if it is withdrawn, which does happen, so the trial aborted or 
um, rescheduled, it's really difficult because it can really feel like they're not believed that what the what happened that you know, oh gosh they threw it out because uh, you know um, they didn't believe that it happened or and sort of come all that way and have it withdrawn is um, really 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 challenging and upsetting and so a lot of the conversations I will have around that will be around how it's not about you it's about this the rules of evidence they don't fit your experience and needs remind them that they're still believed it's just that um, there are these rules and I'll, and I'll unpack that with them. Um, a lot of follow-up work is unpacking and processing of the trial. Um, and with, you know, CAR in particular, we, we had a follow-up appointment and um, to talk about, you know, to talk about her victim impact statement and sentencing. And she'd reached a place of acceptance about the challenges of how, of, of how he'd been found guilty of some of the charges, but not the main one. And, you know, she'd become quite resolved about that. She did want to go to the sentencing. She wanted to prepare a victim impact statement. Um, she made jokes about how she might avoid doing this. Um, but I, the thing about the sentencing and the victim impact statement is neither of those are actually, um, you know, compulsory. Like, survivors can choose not that's the one part <laughs> that they can choose not to participate whereas with a trial they are expected and, and legally they have to participate um, so when I met with her to do her victim impact statement what was really important for her was that um, even though he hadn't been found guilty of the rape that we still talked about how she'd been affected by the rape so we were able to weave that into the victim impact statement because in victim impact statements they can only talk about um, the charges that they've been found guilty of but something that i think is very important that we still weave in the full picture so we were able to do that without talking directly to um, the rape charge and this really helped her feel that her whole experience was being voiced at the sentencing and that the person who caused the harm was gonna was, was she was telling him about the harm he had caused her um, and also in preparing them for sentencing sentencing through an open court um, the offenders supporters might be there anyone can be wandering around so again it's about coming up with a um, coping strategies and support plan for the sentencing and giving them that realistic expectation of what to expect when they're there and have, yeah, having those support plans in place you can also read out the victim impact statement for them on their behalf and lots of survivors do um, ask me to do that but then some also want to stand up and read it themselves and then we can stand up and read it with them and with Cara she was very focused she read a statement out with me at her side um, she uh, reflected that she was able to look at him directly and that he looked guilty and scared and this this experience had helped her feel very you know a lot better um, and empowered she said I feel really empowered for doing that not that everyone is going to go to sentencing and feel empowered. Again, it's always a very individual experience, but for Cara, a generic example, it was empowering. Um, and there were no appeals, so I didn't have to explore um, an appeal process with her, um, but I, I had talked to her about that possibility. And at our very final appointment, um, she had, even though she was still expressing a great deal of disappointment in how he could be found guilty on some charges, but not all. She did feel as resolved as she could and that she could start to move on. She also felt that she needed to do something about our justice system. So there was also this need for her to give feedback. And I was able to um, provide her an arena for giving feedback, um, an opportunity to give feedback um, as well. So that was through giving feedback through um, the courts. There was a link on the Ministry of Justice website to give feedback and then also you know well if there's if you want to talk to a researcher then we can connect you up with somebody to talk about it as well okay all right so at the end I got a bit lost in that labyrinth too um so you might remember my my diagram from the very beginning about what survivors bring are bringing with them when they enter the justice system 
And this is the ideal. This is by no means every survivor who comes into the service comes away and feels this. But this is hopefully a nice little level um, space for them at the end. They're feeling, I mean, I've questioned like safe because there's no guarantees of safety. Um, and yeah, I think that's a, that will take a, you know, in regards to safety, even though that is what survivors really need and the, for many a driving reason why they report, it's still not a guarantee because we've still got the fact that the offender might come out of jail. You know, and if it's been a not guilty verdict, then obviously we haven't got very strong guarantees of safety. Okay, now I know that I'm running out of time. So um, there is a section here on the future and hopefulness, which just um, talks about the Auckland and Whangarei sexual violence court pilot, which was run a few, a few years ago. And the outcome of that, which was, you know, the ways that, the, that um, these trials could be improved. At the moment, we've had um, the Sexual Violence Legislation Bill, which is currently being opposed by New Zealand First. Um, and then, of course, there is the UK government has um, been running a pilot um, since 2014 in regards to the Section 28 Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act. And these things have already been put in place, have been found to work fine in adversarial justice. So pre-recorded cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses, um, the judge and prosecution can review the defence questions and cross them out and say, no, you can't ask that, or no, that's too repetitive, which is just beautiful. <laughs> we really need that. And pre-recorded cross-examination um, so that um, vulnerable witnesses don't have to go to trial. And when we're talking about vulnerable witnesses for this research, our um, survi survivors fall under that. And there we go. That's it. Ken Aku, everyone, that has been a fantastic presentation. And just to um, let everyone know um, who's still online with us, all of this is going to be recorded and the slides will be made available as well. So we, um, I'm noticing we're at 12, so if people do need to leave, that is fine. But maybe, Yvonne, you and I, we definitely have time for some Q&A. How does that sound? So if Sounds you've got good. time to stay on, please do stay. If you need to rush, don't worry. Um, it is all going to be recorded and you can look at just the Q&A section afterwards if you can't stick around. So um, just reflections from me around this um, topic and it echoes um, something someone's just said in the um, in the chat, which is, you know, how pivotal, how specialist this role is and for a successful um, guidance through the labyrinth, how important it is to have knowledge of the labyrinth, um, to be able to be the guide for those who have, have you know, have experienced already trauma and are navigating a complex system in itself. So that came across really strongly and loved the comment around standing on the shoulders of both those with lived experience and um, the professionals that have come before you. And, um, and it's nice now that we can learn from you as your new shoulders that are passing um, the wisdom to others. So thank you for that. Um, so we've got a few questions which I'll, I'll navigate through and try and condense them so we can get through all of them. The first is about your role and its relationship with the court system. And there's a few questions in here, but we'll start off with how does your role work alongside the Crown Prosecutor? And what's the relationship there? And tell us a bit about that. Okay, so um, not all Crown Prosecutors necessarily understand this role. There are some who have worked in many trials with me who have seen, um, seen how this role works. But generally, um, they might just think of us as a support person. So it takes time for Crown Prosecutors to kind of see and understand what it is that we're doing. Um, and the more Crown Prosecutors have worked with me, the more that they are able to see that um, survivors are much more calmer and a little bit more focused and have got a lot. And the fact that they've got that, that they've had that preparation and support really makes a difference during the trial. So the Crown Prosecutors that understand the role and see it do do recognize the difference that it makes and I mean this really again it's like what I talked about um, in the sort of court culture is about building relationships and something when the crown building that relationship with the crown to sort of differentiate our role from just a, a support person that turns up but as a professional 
um, role. Yeah, but it, it does take time. Yeah, but they there are some that do and some that don't. And the ones that know the ones that know what I do will ask for me as a support person for um, their trials. And so, like like many of our roles of advocacy, the the core is relationships as as always. Yeah, we are nothing without our relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the next, uh, I'm going to agglomerate a few questions, um, but it's all around cultural. And you talked about, um, you know, in your service in particular, it is just you. Um, so you're having to navigate lots of cross-cultural um, ways of being and working. Um, so in particular, what Kopa for Māori values and principles do you apply to your to your mahi and work? So I, something that is very important is recognizing that you know at, at my history as a um, what, as a Pakiha and um, that because the justice system is driven by Pakiha values is that when I'm my cup of Māori um, practice I guess is that when I'm working with Māori that their needs their worldview and is much more important than mine and that I need to um, kind of step back a little bit from being any having any kind of understanding about their experience and the history that they come with. I mean, I'm always thinking. I mean, this is a Pakeha thing, but I'm also thinking about the fact that it's the crown, like it's the crown. The trials are called the crown versus. So even the language um, is is traumatic in many ways. It was a reminder of that. So when I, you know. I, whenever I, a Māori comes in to our service, I always connect them with another, um, with a with a cup of Māori service. But of course, with working with them, um, I guess that is my mahi, and that they are the ones in control. That I'm not, um, that I'm stepping back. Because the other thing is, I don't want to be looked at as being the dominant person who has all the knowledge and holds all the power. So it's about sharing that and also what their needs like for example if they want to do a karakia before they give their evidence saying to the judge this is what's going to happen and this is what they're going to do and making sure that that so as much as possible weaving in what is culturally really important to them yeah mm -hmm. into a, yeah, I hope that, that yeah yeah and I know in the practice session and um, when we were having chats together we also talked about you know those bigger picture systems change in terms of um, like needing equivalent Kaupapa Māori uh, sexual violence court support services so that um, you know it's not just you and Tamaki as the specialist person and we know that um, Kaupapa Māori services do go to court but they don't yet have the resourcing to have that service separate um, and just really um, that kind of bigger pitch advocacy as well of needing justice reform and having Kaupapa Māori um, justice uh, processes that you know can be separate from as you say the crown which is a you know for within the context of colonization is a huge um kind of just the position of you're the is the entity that has created so much historical harm and now is trying to hold justice for me in this moment so yeah really complicated yeah. and good to kind of go this role in the bigger picture eh, of how much how much um work needs to be done in this area yeah of promoting um, justice for, for Māori in, in Aotearoa. And I mean, it is a partnership, you know, so I feel that very, very strongly when I do go to trial with Māori, that I'm working in partnership with them, you know, that I'm not replicating, um, you know, the, you know the, our, our colonisation dynamics, that I'm working in partnership all the way, yeah. And in terms of other cultures, um, there was a quick question in terms of how much do interpreters get used and how does that work? So yes, interpreters do get used a lot. We there's always often because of the um, the small community, the some of some especially some of our refugee populations are very small communities. So sometimes the interpreter they'll be known to um, the survivors. So there have been times where we've had to fly up interpreters from other parts of New Zealand. Um, so yes, interpreters do get used. Um, but under, you know, but there's always you know um, there's always some issues to troubleshoot with them. The other thing with interpreters is that if they're not trained in trauma or they have some, I've heard, you know, they can, they're a mixed bag, but they are used. But um, yeah, we, we need more. 
And I also feel like we need them to be um, have some kind of trauma informed training. Yeah. yeah. And, and just specialist training around confidentiality and discussing these topics specifically with people, I think is really, yeah. um, really important. And, um, and just to plug in another service and that I know you access is Sharma, who um, offer a national um, sexual violence support service and are great, also people, a great organisation to do cultural um like to consult around cultural specific needs of survivors and seeing if they can access different support through them. So um, just a quick plug to Sharma, who I know is in the group at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, there's the next question is probably we discussed this, that it probably needs a webinar to itself or a training to itself in terms of how do you prepare children differently from adults. Um, and that's, you know, that we've we had a bit of a chat about that and it's um, yeah. Do you want to mention anything in this forum around how does that work with children or should we should we book another <laughs> webinar? <laughs> I think we need to um, book another webinar for that one. Um, but I think, we, I mean, I guess the key thing when we're working with children, we are also working with a caregiver. I mean, we're working with a family in crisis and we're working um, with a caregiver as well in regards to what is that caregiver, what is the caregiver doing at home to help um, you know be you know supportive and and understanding with the child as well so there is it's a, it is it's a whole other webinar yeah and i think something else just a, just a keynote is that there have been some incredibly good changes at the Auckland district court in regards to trials with children um who are witnesses that i haven't which might not be across the whole country but they're changes that have definitely made the process my role as well as the trial process mm. a lot easier so but i'm not saying that it's not going to be like that everywhere around new zealand but i think it is a whole other webinar yeah mm. and um i think there's um just also a plug for those who which ties into our next question of um what do you think could change and improve in terms of the system so um in particular the making sure that those who are going through the system receive a safe space and receive justice and just a plug to everyone um in the in the in this webinar you know at the moment the second reading is being stalled so if it's if you've heard this and you feel passionate that change is needed in our system do get hold of your local mps and do let them know that you really support the legislation change because um at the moment it probably does need a bit of voices uh saying how important these changes are but from your um, your experience, which is quite unique of going to court every week um, compared to potentially some other services that it might not be their reg like their every week piece of their work. Um, if you were to if you were to pick your top things that need to change, what would you what would you change? Oh God! Just a quick little thing. <laughs> it's, Give it's, us your, it's your another, opinion. That's another webinar. Um, okay, so. <laughs> There's my um, my dream court, okay, and I think uh, there's my dream court, which is not an adversarial justice model, which uh, completely, it's a justice model, it's not a one size fits all justice model, it's a justice model that um, definitely addresses the needs that survivors, their families and offenders have when they enter, you know, when they, when they enter the justice system. So multiple courts for, you know, or a court system that is able to be flexible around that. I think in the adversarial justice model, I want in, in the UK that the S28 um, pilot that I was talking about, that survivors have a pre-recorded cross-examination that happens shortly after they've reported, that gets played as the evidence at trial, so they don't even have to go to trial. Um, and that pre-recorded cross-examination, the questions have been edited and audited, whatever you want to call it, by the judge so that their very traumatic, repetitive questions are taken out. That's a really good place to start. Um, and I think, yeah, I think what we need is we need to take the defence lawyers at the moment have far too much power in, in the adversarial justice model that we have, but we we can tweak it and make changes so that it is less traumatic for survivors but definitely so the pre-recorded cross-examination and that um, the judge having a lot more control over what the defense counsel can and can't ask because at the moment they can they can do whatever they like they can ask whatever they like yeah so that would be a really good start and then we haven't got um, survivors waiting for years to go to trial because the trial will just happen when it needs to happen 
and they've already done their pre-recorded cross-examination. So it, that would yeah, be would do so much in terms of not um, needing to hold on to everything while you're waiting to get to court. And but... yeah, and it would also be uh, it would be more efficient from a judicial perspective mm -hmm. as well. Um, so because trying to organise a trial is like herding cats. It's you know so. Yeah, it would work. It would work for a lot of professionals in other ways as well, not just for survivors. So it would make certain things more efficient. Right. Yeah. Um, after the conviction and sentence, and then appeal and crown standing down from appeal, is there anything else people can actually do in terms of the process that you are aware of? Um, in regards to seeking justice. Yeah. No. No. Uh, and so. I the only possibility could be restorative justice. Restorative justice. justice. Yeah. And of course, restorative justice is amazing, but it doesn't, you know, again, it doesn't always fit all, um, all, all the different um, abuse experiences that our survivors have been through. So unfortunately, no, there isn't. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, trust me, I come to a lot, I get out of the labyrinth and there's, um, some pretty upsetting and difficult places that I'm, you know, that, that survivors are in. Yeah. And one of those is that there is no, um, if, if they, they, they can't, oh, have, I've been asked so many times, can we take it back to trial? Can we do this again? And we, we can't. So the only thing, the only silver lining, and it's not even a silver lining, is that if the offender does it again, offends like that again and ends up um, you know being arrested again that that person's evidence can come to the next trial as propensity but propensity is just dog oh, he had he did he did something like this before but wasn't found guilty but it's not yeah it's a very poor fit to what our survivors need yeah yeah again it's that loss of control there's no voice their needs are not being met at all yeah um there's, there's quite a few um questions here around you know why do we need a jury system um how is it easy is it to get close um circuit tv systems but also why are the courts not closed and what, why you know why are they allowed visitors um for any of it but it was good in the we had quite a few experts in the chat as well that were answering the questions as they went so um you know the, the court is closed when uh the survivor is giving their witness um so in terms of process i suppose i, I think the the jury trial kind of sits within that broader system of it is the adversarial system and the system that we've inherited in many ways in this country so i think some of the changes in the broader justice review that's happening are really good to keep up to date with in terms of um, both the pilot courts and also the broader systems change um so is there anything you would like to add in any of that i'm just trying to no, I, I mean, I mean, jury trials. It's a very antiqua, antiqua, antiquated idea that um, you know that twelve of your peers are able, you know, should make that decision. They should be presented the evidence in such a in a professional way that they can then make the right, you know, make a decision beyond reasonable doubt that this person. Oh. Sorry, that's okay. Do that is glitching it's totally glitching yeah. Ooh. Ah. okay um so this idea that 12 people can make this decision um because it's but that's this idea of fairness but of course with um you know sexual violence those 12 members of the public are being kind of having rape myths and victim blaming ideas kind of shoved down their throat by defense lawyers mm -hmm. and the reality is that they might also come infused with those ideas anyway or themselves might also have you know offended you know be you know a, you know a sexual offender or um you know they might come in with you know the csi effect which is that idea that the legal professionals know what's best and we must listen to everything that they say so they're not even necessarily going to um you know they're going to be believing they're going to have this that the justice the idea of the the justice system already has power over them in their decision making yeah 
last last wrap up questions. Um, one's a really simple one. How do people access um, your service? Okay, so they can call Help Auckland and they can ask to um, they can ask to be in contact with the court support service. So you just call our 0800 number. Yeah. So I'll just put in the chat um, your web your website so that everyone can find that. Um, and the last question is how do how do people train to become a court support person and what's the self care strategy you put in place around this work? Yeah. So how would you train? Um, I'm the only one doing it. Um, I'm just. I was trained by the person who. Um, did the work before me. So I think training is definitely something that needs to be thought about and developed for this role. Um, uh, if, if anyone is going to trial with, with one of their clients and they would like to check in with me, they are more than welcome to. They can again call help and ask to check in with me if they have any questions. Um, um, and in regards to self-care and well, you have to take very good care of yourself. I actually did a whole other section on vicarious trauma, which again is probably another webinar. Um, but your self-care has to be very, I think the, th the first thing that you are having to cope with is that you're witnessing the abuse of your client. That's what you're witnessing when in a cross examine or through the whole process. And you are quite helpless in what to do with that. You know? And when we're witnessing abuse, there is this sort of, um, and I guess you see it, I see it a lot in some, especially defence, so it's like a desensitisation to it um, because you, you, you can't do anything. Like normally if you see something awful, you feel like you can do something about it, even if you can exit the situation, but it's not like that at all. And the, the self-care is very important. Um, so I, I mean, I'm a very creative person. Um, I engage in lots of different creative activities that really help me process, um, process the work. But I also, and I also do yoga, um, yeah, and I just have very good relationships. I also don't, you know, outside of my work, I, I just make sure that I have relationships that um, kind of understand that I don't necessarily want to talk about my work much and that I need to, I need to have fun and I need to enjoy myself. Because I think the other thing with doing this work is that people are like, oh, it's really interesting because people find the court fascinating, as I mentioned before, all the legal things, it's got the sort of romantic, oh, um, so yeah, for me, it's very important to just have relationships that really are really respectful of what my needs are. Yeah. Right. So I think well, there's lots of beautiful comments coming um, through of thanking you for your knowledge and amazing wisdom. And I echo those sentiments of this has been incredibly informative and I can really, um, also give testament to the fact that my first time in court as a uh, support worker, I did get hold of Yvonne um, many, many years ago and go, what do I do? And it was very, very useful to just um, have the process clear as a support worker um, to be able to then guide the client. So um, do get in touch and, uh, and you know, use this webinar as a resource within your services and within um, your crisis teams to, to just be able to get a sense of what might be coming up for the client in different, uh, different pieces of the work. So thank you so much. It's been an incredible honor for me to have you here today um, and get to talk about this very complicated piece of work um, that you do. And thank you so much. Thank Is there any last... Me. Oh, so we will end with a karakia um, and thank you everyone who stayed online even though we went a little bit over there's still quite a few of you so you must have been interested in the Q&A thank you so much there's so many of you there's a few of you that are new many of you that are regulars to this space and it's so lovely to be able to share this information with you all so we'll close with a karakia and send you all well off on your journey reminding all of us to do self-care um, in our lives and um, Looking forward to hopefully a self care weekend. So, Unihia, 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 Kite Uri Tapunui, Kiawatia, Kemama, Tenako, Titinana, Te Wairua, Itaara Takata, Kuyara, Erungo, Fakaira, Kirunga, Kiatina, Tina, Huye, Tai, Kie, Kiara Koto.